Well, I'm very honored to uh, be a speaker, and I uh, really have loved working with Judeo over the years. I'll never forget when he came to my office uh, um, somewhere in the early 90s or almost two decades ago and more or less said something along the lines of saying, I think I have a solution to the problem of causality. I kind of thought, uh-oh, um, I wonder if the, uh, where security is. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, then uh, I realized that uh, he actually was talking about something of substance. But over the years, I've had a very enjoyable, the right kind of professional tension with Judea over just how much we can do with causal diagrams in a field like epidemiology. That would include observational social sciences. And um, <clears throat> so even though I'm not as, uh, can't, I couldn't be called a skeptic, I've, I've tried to introduce and push DAGs and, and so forth, the causal diagrams in epidemiology and health sciences. Um, <clears throat> I have some sympathy with those who are a little, who are a bit resistant. I understand where they're coming from, knowing how bad the data are we have. And for those of you who are, what I'm going to say here, for those of you, I've, I've seen some of these presentations in computer science, it won't, probably won't mean much. But for those of us who are in causal modeling in the health and social sciences, it may mean something. So I'm saying I'm standing in a little bit for Phil David today who's acted as, I think I, I, it's good to have these skeptics to come back and force or sharpen our thinking. So um, <clears throat> that's my acknowledgement to him for not being here, but he's been going around. Another one? Okay. He's been going around giving a talk called Beware of the Dag. And, <laughs> and um, I don't, th I think he went I'm trying to try and fill in a middle ground, I think, or uh, that is uh, relevant. And we all recognize, or I hope you all recognize, of course, graphical models without the causal baggage necessarily have a long history before and outside of causal modeling. In fact, Judea was a major contributor in modern times. And of course, the graph theory that we see in that goes back a long ways. So I don't have much time. I'll skip over the things. Uh, some of these. But, of course, Judea made it very clear what a causal graph would mean, at least to me, um, that others define as a causal diagram if it depicts the functional relations in a causal model, where the latter is a recursive system of structural equations showing these causal relations and um, <clears throat> within the given time ordering of events. Now, by the way, I, I, in an early version of this, I, I showed, I met with lunch with Judea and he went over some of these slides quickly. So any uh, problems in them, I, I'll blame him. Um, <clears throat> more restrictive definitions, uh, some people like, and I think, I think sometimes it's hard for me to tell with David and Cox and Veramuth exactly how far more skeptical they are, but it seems sometimes some people say that uh, restrictions should be made so that the only causal nodes are intervention nodes. And uh, I see Judeo waving his hands, but I must acknowledge these views exist, and they do exist, yes. And they are strongly held by some. Um, but that leaves the remainder of the graph to just structure of conditional independencies. Uh, then I, one of the inspirations for me to make these comments was this more dubious definition I felt, this more dubious, has become common in epidemiology, where they say a causal diagram is an unconfounded graph. All shared causes are in the graph. I, th I think of that as a scientifically vacuous definition. It's all it's saying is that the diagram is causal if the causal model it represents is correct. That doesn't make any sense the way it's put. It's also incomplete in that it ignores selection effects. And it's also unver an unverifiable and presumably very rare condition. So to define a graph as causal if it's unconfounded assumes a possibly large set of causal null hypotheses, two for every pair of nodes in the graph that they share neither uncontrolled causes nor conditioned effects not in the graph. And for epidemiologic modeling of observed variables, this assumption is equivalent to feces from a male host primogenius. <laughs> it's a polite way of putting it. An important point to me, as I've all been involved in lots of real epidemiologic studies and controversies, is that causal DAGs are chock full of nulls that for every node pair, there's no shared ancestor not in the graph, and there's also no shared condition descendant not in the graph. So that's just a way of saying this, it's unconfounded again. Every unconditional causal DAG also assumes that for every non-adjacent node pair, we have, but they're not directly affecting each other. And unfortunately, in my field and, and related ones, uh, 
few, if any, of these novels will have convincing support. I mean, empirical support, anything like experimental support, especially. Uh, <clears throat> many of the, most of the arrows shown in diagrams include, they encode no data other than an observed conditional sequential association. Uh, so we're back to Hume, basically, which may be due to <clears throat> them being, having a common cause or uh, affecting a common selection. Absence of arrows and codes, strong nulls that no mechanism exists that leads directly from one node to another. Again, we usually lack supporting data. A realistic causal graph will have numerous unobserved latent nodes, often more th of them than observed nodes. They'll have few node pairs without an arc between them and will provide no observed set of variables sufficient for bias control. We'll have a selection node that is potentially affected by most other nodes. So if I consider what I call a vaguely realistic causal model for a single exposure disease analysis, where I've got exposure X and outcome Y and known antecedents, uh, measurements of each of these things, then other antecedents that are unmeasured or ignored or maybe even unknown, and then selection, which uh, should always be shown as conditioned on a graph in our field. We always have selection. In fact, uh, I like to call the selection node the superconducting super collider. Because it's a collider, it's got arrows coming into it from all over the place, including from latent nodes and observed nodes and <coughs> measurements. And if I was doing a retrospective case control study, of, for example, of nicotine and Alzheimer's, that's a hot topic, I would end up with a graph like that. And I could look at that pretty quickly and say, I don't have identification uh, from what's observed. What's observed are the things without parens. I use parens to denote the unobserved un things. Then there are their measurements. There are x star, y star, c star. Things can get better in some studies. By design, if by design we set up things, some of these errors get eliminated. But rarely can, and this is why epidemiology generates so much controversy, rarely do we get identification from the observations. What we get from causal DAG theory is a lot of demonstrations of why we don't have identification when people claim we do. They, people claim that this causes that. And the great thing about DAGs to me is that I can show you why they haven't got good empirical support for that, even if it's plausible, which it isn't necessarily. But so what, what can I do with graphs that is positive? This is the question uh, I think that Phil David was, may have been raising. Well, an alternative is to go back and recognize that graphs are more DAGs, in particular, are more general objects than just attached to a causal model and then causal diagrams. We can do predictive analysis, and if that's as far as we can go empirically, if it's a good thing to go that far and present it at that stage, then causal analysis becomes speculative. So right now, there's a brewing uh, controversy in, I'd say, in epidemiologic methodology about causal modeling and causal analysis. Right now, it's almost become this holy phrase that can pack a room at SCR, for example, like an overflow. And yet, what's it producing for me as somebody who's involved in sort of trench warfare involving uh, you know, all kinds of lawsuits involving pharmaceuticals and uh, congressional hearings? And the answer is almost nothing, in fact, because it's we don't have any identification, one way of putting it. So if current models for the observed, no matter what they are, can't be taken seriously as causal, what can we make of, of their outputs? So we, as a Bayesian, we could see them as bets, but not one we take seriously for intervention. A uh, common frequentist defense of model-based inferences is data summaries, but that's got to be a stretch for some of these uh, causal models, structural models. And I would say that structural models, it seems to me, they need to be tested on an empirical predictive playing field uh, because I can't expect them to do well for causal inference if they're not good for predictive inference. That's how I would look at it. Um, <clears throat> so graphs remain useful and might be less misleading if not interpreted as causal. Uh, so often what we need for health and social science is, is something predictive. And often that's all we're capable of. Uh, in, including that task is prediction of outcomes following interventions. That's causal inference. And that calls for intervention studies, experiments, which in epidemiology often refute. In fact, about at the rate you'd expect if the epi studies were coin tosses, they're often refuting epidemiologic findings from 20 studies. So the DAGs have long served as schematics for learning algorithms. That's 
with this area that Judea has been a monumental contributor. And that's what happens when we're used as influence diagrams, belief networks, and so on, all these uh, different names without explicit causal interpretation. Some or all of the arrows in predictive graphs may retain informal causal interpretations, but can be causally wrong and still be correct, correctly informative for important predictive questions. So, and, and I may have some technical, little technical mistakes here, but they, they're, my main overarching point is that the dagger rules will remain valid for prediction when we give the right interpretation, predictive interpretation, to the arrows in the graphs. Uh, so, for example, when we say x arrow y, we could mean that it's, we have this relation that x predicts y given everything, a bunch of other things, and that may only be because they have a common cause or they are have, they're both influencing, say, selection, which, and I have a, there's a classic example in epidemiology, which is uh, where the outcome is congenital malformations, and the x is a, uh, for example, a, 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 a exposure early in pregnancy. We, there are a lot of miscarriages that take place, a lot missing. All we see at the end is what's selected for birth and then gets registered in a birth defect registry. And this predictive knowledge is still useful, and so we, but we could be very misled if we call it causal knowledge. It may be that something is not causing a malformation, it's actually preventing a malformation by uh, in some other mechanism but causing selective uh, spontaneous abortion. So we have causal ideas of why this happens. But the main thing is we see is something predictive. And the same thing goes when, when they have a co common cause when that XROI, we, we write causally that, but this happens a lot in diet and health. So many, that's the big, nutrition especially, nutritional epidemiology has been the real Waterloo, and it's why I got into epidemiology, was my interest in nutrition, where so much of the stuff has been refuted in trials. Um, there's hardly uh, any of the vitamin hypotheses have survived except for vitamin D, uh, it have survived in trial tests. And yet people were so certain, if we were using the, uh, these ideas, predictive ideas, being more modest about causal assertions, we wouldn't have been led in situations where huge numbers, literally millions of people, got into taking supplements like beta carotene in the 1980s, which turned out to be, from what the trials tell us, harmful or at best worthless. And I wouldn't want to see graphical theory contributing to this problem in epidemiology. I'm not blaming graphical theory for it, but the way it gets touted these days, it could be a contributor. Saying, oh, we've drawn a graph, we've solved the problem. Uh, but Phil David goes so far as to sort of put, say, well, they're just, graphs just represent, in some of his talks, probabilities, distributions. Saying, well, no, there's something more there. There's something temporal. There is a particular ordering, because we all know there's several different ways that we could represent the probability distribution in a graph. What makes one special if it's not causal? Well, it doesn't have to be causal to identify one as saying this particular ordering represents the temporal ordering. That's going to be most relevant. And so, <clears throat> and, and that matches the fact that in observational health and social sciences, most arrows shown in diagrams encode no real data other than an obs that observed conditional temporal sequencing. Beyond that, they're just hypothesis, hypothesized mechanisms, plausible perhaps, but there's lots of plausible mechanisms and we can get sucked into believing in a mechanism just because the empirical associations match the prediction. That can be wrong because there could be many other mechanisms. Um, <clears throat> well, what about the uh, nulls that we have? Lack of an arrow from x to y now corresponds to lack of ad additional predictive value for y given x. Uh, now, a direct causal effect of x on y leads to violations. We still can think in causal terms, but again, as an intuitive background, and aiding our judgments about what should be predictive. So, <clears throat> practically speaking, this also raises the issue of pruning. Uh, practically speaking, emitting the arrow may be justified because its contribution is too small to stand out against what may be considered a noise and certainly bias. It doesn't mean that the effect involved is small from a value perspective. It just means that we just we can't pick it out against the background. And that raises a question for me about the predictive role for so-called causal models. I would be very interested to see evaluations of MSMs, SNMs, the contributions that Jamie has made, uh, 
as devices for prediction from stochastic processes. Even when the prediction is from one selection measurement process to another with no deduction for causal intervention. But they need to be evaluated against non-causal models in those prediction problems. What is it that the causal models give us? They give us a means of inserting causal priors into our predictive modeling. And I think Judea, that just is almost paraphrasing what Judea said in the beginning, emphasized in the beginning of his book, causality. But it, that's what I see in these parametric models, if there to be any help at all. Were you raising? No. So here's my challenge to the current longitudinal causal modeling literature that comes out of this. If we know our observations are just a dim and distant projection of the causal structure, and we can only identify predictive links among the observed, what are the predictive advantages of structural modeling? Modeling potential outcomes as well as observed outcomes, as if they were latent variables of interest compared to pure association modeling. Well, it's what I, would, I just said. I, it's what Judea, I believe, has been saying for decades. Zero? OK. Well, I could end there. Let me just see if there's anything. Uh, I'll just go right to, I want to see answers that are sensible when targets are direct and indirect effects in a context at least that complex. Look at that diagram. Okay. Keep that in mind. My summary, conclusions, just because a method is labeled causal modeling does not mean it gives us estimates and, te and tests of actual target effects. In most observational epidemiology, graphs need many latent nodes to be causal, the way people define that, some people. DAGs need not be saddled with the burden of causality to be useful if we scale back our ambitions from control to prediction. And we can always go forward again when new data warrant causal inferences, such as experiments. Okay, that's it. Thanks.